This is StoryBeat, Storytellers on Storytelling, an exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, we're in for a real treat today. My guest is one of the funniest men who's ever lived, the incomparable, multi-talented Phil Proctor. Phil's 68-year career has taken him from Broadway, where he appeared in The Sound of Music and A Time for Singing, to a lifetime of performing all over the world, even to the former Soviet Union with the legendary Yale Russian Chorus. Though Phil has appeared for over half a century on LPs, CDs, DVDs, and on stage and screen in titles such as Zachariah, God's Clowns, Hot Shorts, The Mad House of Dr. Fear with Don Adams, Eat or Be Eaten, Procter & Bergman's TV or Not TV, and the overdubbed cult hit Republic cliffhanger J-Men Forever, he is best known by far as one of the founding members of the incredibly legendary Firesign Theater, the tour de force four-man group listed by Entertainment Weekly as one of the 30 greatest acts of all time. A few of Firesign's beloved comedy albums include Waiting for the Electrician or Someone Like Him, How Can You Be in Two Places at Once When You're Not Anywhere at All, Don't Crush That Dwarf Hand Me the Pliers, I Think We're All Bozos on This Bus, The Tale of the Giant Rat of Sumatra, Everything You Know is Wrong, and The Three Faces of Al. In 2001-2002, Firesign created Fools in Space, a monthly two-hour live show on XM Satellite Radio, which won the New York International Radio Festival's Golden Award for Best Continuing Comedy Series. Also in 2001, the group produced the PBS special Weirdly Cool, which I happened to see live in, uh, in Los Angeles, featuring Firesign's greatest skits, hosted by uh, great fans like Robin Williams, George Carlin, John Goodman, and Chevy Chase. Firesign appeared at the London Comedy Store for BBC4 Radio, also featuring Mort Saul, Stan Freeberg, Bob Newhart as Americans who influenced British comedy. In 2006, their album, Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers, was inducted into the Library of Congress as an historical recording. And in 2014, Firesign received the Norman Corwin Award for Excellence in Broadcasting. Phil shared three Grammy nominations with the Firesign Theater and three daytime Emmys for voicing Howard DeVille on Rugrats. On stage, Phil is part of the celebrated Antaeus Classical Theater Company. He's performed in plays such as Samuel Warren Joseph's Window of Opportunity and in For Piano and Harpo, written by and starring The Simpsons' Dan Castellaneta as Oscar Levant. And he's toured in the U.S. and Canada in a one-man reading of Don Quixote with the Grammy-nominated L.A. Guitar Quartet. Besides spending three seasons as the announcer on the reality show Big Brother, he's created countless voices in commercials and interactive games such as Dr. Vidic in Assassin's Creed, Batman Arkham Knight, Final Fantasy, Call of Duty, Riddick, and Lord of the Rings. Phil has also voiced the drunken French monkey in Eddie Murphy's Dr. Doolittle series, Seahorse Bob in Finding Nemo, and Charlie in Monsters, Inc., to name a few. In the world of radio, Phil traveled to Dublin, Ireland for four years to act with his wife, Melinda, in Roger Gregg's Crazy Dog Audio Theater and in live audio presentations in Owensboro, Kentucky, for the International Mystery Writers Festival, where they were made Kentucky colonels. On screen, Phil has appeared in numerous movies and TV shows, including Henry Jiglom's first film, A Safe Place, with no less than Tuesday Weld, Orson Welles, and Jack Nicholson. On TV, he's appeared in The Last Man Standing, Arrested Development, Jimmy Kimmel Live, and The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. 
and he's guest starred in such classic shows as All in the Family, Night Court, Dave's World, Golden Girls, Cagney and Lacey, and Simon and Simon. Currently with comic legend Jamie Alcroft of Mac and Jamie fame, he satirizes news on the web series Boomers on a Bench. They've also appeared regularly on J.P. Houston's syndicated radio show American Parlor Song. In September of this year, 2017, Phil and David Osman appeared in a command performance of the Firesign Theater, or What's Left of It, on the Coolidge stage of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Their appearance sold out in three days. Today, most of Firesign's classic albums and books are available at www.firesigntheater.com, including their latest, Everything You Know is Wrong, Declassified, a two-DVD set of their films, videos, and home movies, produced by Taylor Jessen. And if that's not enough, Phil has just released his eye-opening autobiography, Where's My Fortune Cookie? My Psychic Surrealistic Story, co-written with Brad Schreiber. You can keep up with Phil on his monthly blog, Planet Proctor, at www.planetproctor.com. Well, we've run out of time, so thanks, Phil, for coming on. <laughs> it's my incredible honor to welcome to Storybeat the one and only Phil Proctor. Thanks, uh, Phil, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, Steve, I'm exhausted. You and I me think, both. <laughs> I think I'll just, I'll just lie down for a while. <laughs> it, it, you have certainly... Yeah, that's, that's, it, it is an amazing thing to hear you know, what, what one has accomplished in 77 years of life. Mm-hmm. And I've been 60, over 60 years of that time, I've been uh, in show business in one way or another. Well, you know, I started as a child actor on live television yeah. in New York on a show called Uncle Danny Reads the Funnies that uh, Elliot Gould was also a child actor wow. on. Okay? And, yeah. and it's, it, you know, even though I, I took breaks to uh, go to school and educate myself, it was just inevitable that I would have to continue a life in show business, uh, which I, I committed myself to uh, at the end of uh, the, my senior year at Yale when I was cast in uh, The Edge of Night as a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of my, where I picked up my professional career again. When I originally did that show, uh, on, on television in New York, there were no unions, and I was paid in the sponsor's product, which was a bag of hurdy gurdy oranges. <laughs> okay, and it got a little better once we unionized, <laughs> but you, uh, but still, you know, that bag of hurdy gurdy oranges, I'll never forget it. it, you, was, it you, was, you moved up to boxes of oranges, not bags. Yeah, of right. A, a year's supply of oranges, oh, man. which you have to eat, you know, quickly. Because they'll spoil. Of course. And so I guess if one can make a career out of eating oranges, I guess that would be okay. But, That's right. Uh, now, of course, the, the nature of this show of yours is about the writing process, That's right? correct. That's correct. So yeah, let, let and me... that's something which I also uh, always had a knack for uh, when I was uh, a youngster. And, uh, and I enjoyed, you know, especially in, in English class, writing free-form stories and things um and i and i i devoured all the works of hg wells in my spare time you know yes i was, I was I, addicted to science fiction and and so it seems logical that when the fireside theater came along uh this surrealistic group of like-minded people that we all kind of had in common a love of the uh, fantastic you know and 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 a, a sense of the future you know, I always think of us as being like futuristic funny men because so many of the albums that we wrote together dealt with uh, predictions, if you will, uh, as to where the world was heading. And you've and predicted the future. You, you've actually predicted the future more than a few times, have you not? Yeah, we have, uh, sometimes in scary ways. Um, the, I guess for those of uh, people who are familiar with the Firesign Theater, our first album, Waiting for the Electrician or Someone Like Him, predicted really the downfall of the Soviet Union, and uh, in particular, the, uh, the, the freeing of the satellites that were under uh, Soviet dominance at the time. And what's ironic is that after we did that album, uh, and, and which was not named for uh, anything in particular, it was named uh, because Peter Bergman was uh, uh, on, a, on a rooftop in Amsterdam when there was a blackout, okay? And he came up with the phrase, we're waiting for the electrician or 
uh, and, oh yeah, and one of the guys said, well, I guess we're all waiting for the electrician, and Bergman said, or someone like it. And that became the title of the album. But here's the thing. Lech Walesa, who uh, started the, the Glasnost movement, Solidarnost, excuse me, the Solidarnost uh, movement, uh, which liberated Poland eventually, do you know what his job was? Was he an electrician? He was a ship's electrician. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a good one. That's, you know? prof- that's prophetic. <laughs> so describe for our listeners what the process of working with four very unique and individual and powerful minds together in collaboration, how does that work? How did that work for you? Ah, uh, well, you see, you just included my powerful mind as one of the uh, other three yes. people that I worked with. And, and I don't know if, if that's really fair. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yes, there are four of us who, who did the writing process, but we called ourselves the four or five crazy guys because the fifth guy <clears throat> to us was the finished product. Whatever that writing finally became was more than the sum of its parts. You know, We would kind of lose ownership of ideas since there were four of us writing uh, together, and uh, ultimately uh, the the final work was uh, the result of this collaboration, and therefore more than just our individual input. But you can imagine it wasn't an easy thing to do for four guys with, you know, we're all fire signs. I'm a Leo, there are two Sagittarians and an Aries, uh, and, and, and we're all fiery personalities, the, you know, strong egos, mm-hmm. and everybody had a particular skill uh, at wordsmithing and and, and uh, improvisation and characterization. So when we were sitting around, uh, w- we would first have to find a, a, a theme in common that we could all focus on. And then the, it was an arduous process of, of writing, you know, uh, a few pages a day of the story that we were trying to create. But we had a great advantage, uh, which, which is one of the reasons why the Fireside Theater was unique and probably will, will always remain unique, uh, in that we had, after our first album was done, uh, a fellow named John McClure, who was in the hierarchy of Columbia Records, an executive, he fought for us to, to be, uh, remain on the album. Uh, pardon me, I'm not saying this correctly, to remain with the company because they were not sure. We didn't sell that many records with Waiting for Electrician, and they, uh, Columbia uh, Suits were not sure that they should keep us on. Right. But John McClure went and he said, you've got to keep these guys on. They're going to be a huge success, and I'm going to sign them on to a spoken arts contract. Huh. Now, what happened with that was we had unlimited free studio time. Okay, that, that, that meant we could write some material. We could go into the studio. We could record it, which you know brought it to life and changed it, and 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 gave us you know a, a real feeling of where we were going. Then we could go back to the table again, write some more, go in, record it. I mean, it was an, it gave us an amazing artistic freedom that no other group in history, so far as I know, ever had. And never again. And, Right, and that's why we were able to to make these very layered, complex, uh, uh, dense albums uh, with uh, to to to, um, to to create the worlds that we had in our heads. Well, I can tell you that my introduction to Fire Sign was way back in Madison, Wisconsin, when I was an undergraduate student there 400 years ago, and <laughs> uh, I. Of course, I listened to many of your albums at that time and could never figure out how you got from the beginning of the A side to the end of the B side because it was one stream of consciousness that just kept rolling. And that it was. Is, it appeared to be. Yes. No, but you see, you know, you just said a very interesting thing because <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that the Firesign Theater, not only were we free to use the state of the art um, production techniques. As you know, as we uh, as we continued to make records over the years, but we were making records that were that you could take home and listen to in the privacy of your own dorm room yes. or under your bed or yes. wherever you wanted to hear it or share it with other people. It was uncensored, and that's why some of the things in our early records we used obscene language, we used the la- the slang of the day, you know, and we also uh, dealt with 
taboo topics many times in our early records because we never we never created them with the idea that they were going to be played on the radio they were being a lot you know they were being sent out as as uh, free speech really basically you know yes and uh, and then it was because of the uh, upsurge of FM radio and the sudden popularity of FM radio that especially on college campuses all of a sudden they were playing our records well I think, know, it, yeah, I think it I think it helped your record side I would without say, any commercial interruption exactly and, and, and I would say in my in, I can speak from my own personal experience I think that it probably helped your sales and popularity that at that time in the world um, lots of college students were in protest mode and were yep. um, using various substances that um, allowed them to listen to your albums in a, probably a slightly enhanced way. Yes, and that's I think, true. I think that helped uh, a lot. Because they certainly did require uh, uh, a certain degree of concentration yes. in order to uh, really enjoy them. That, that was <laughs> definitely part of, of uh, um, our growing success because suddenly people went on co- in colleges wanted to actually see us perform and that was fine for us because one of the ways that one of our writing techniques was that we could take our material and stand it up in front of an audience a local audience here in los angeles at a club called the ash grove mm-hmm. okay which is now the the improv it's right. been the side of the improv for a long long time on melrose on melrose uh-huh but we would write uh for instance don't crush that door fan be the pliers which predicted channel surfing, click, 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 click. Uh, we uh, originally wrote as a piece called A Life in the Day, and it was a, we used the technique of channel surfing uh, uh, it, on stage with rapid changes of masks and costumes and things, and we tried out the whole idea and various skits uh, on stage, which some of which made it into the into the actual album itself. So that gave us a great advantage, too, as writers. But the, the, the main thing about writing with four people, the arduous process that it was, because sometimes we'd, there'd be a writer's block. You know, you, look, if you're writing alone, you had yourself and maybe a friend or a wife or a loved one who says, well, that's crap, mm-hmm. go back and do that again. Right. But if you're writing with two people, you obviously are getting a second opinion all the time, and you're bouncing stuff off of one another. If you're writing with three people, that is, that is comp- added by a factor, another factor of one. You can have two against one, all right? All three can be in unison. You can have uh, a, 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 three separate ideas that are con- conflicting. And now you add four people. You make four people. Oh, yes. No, somebody's trying to call me. Uh, you add... It's, I okay, hope, I hope it's your. I hope it's your agent. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Ex- excuse me, I'm doing a, a radio interview right now. Who's this calling? <laughs> Hello. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye now. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, not for me. <laughs> it's probably a jungle. Anyway, you, it, four people. You can get three against one, two against two, four, four different ideas. You see, it, it, it gets much more complicated. But here's the trick. When we would struggle over some idea or some skit or some, some uh, major segment of an album that we were doing, and finally we'd just say, okay, look, we have to stop here because we're obviously not going to you know, resolve these problems. Let's go into the studio with what we have and see how it plays. We'd go into the studio, and very many times we would throw the script out entirely and improvise oh, wow. the scene. Okay. Yeah. The script became just a blueprint, a blueprint for the the for the construction of the uh, actual skit itself, or the actual interaction. Oh wow! And that informed us more than anything else. It was like writing a play and taking it out of town to try it out, right? And and real and then changing it so that the next night you it was better than it was the night before, and we would do that within you know in like. Four hours in the studio. Wow! So that was a, a relief. It taught us something. It taught us not to. Uh, it taught us to cooperate a little bit more when we were writing together, because we knew it was going to. It was going to change anyway once we stood it up on its feet. Were you doing? Were you laying in sound effects simultaneously or after the fact? No, uh, that was another great advantage that we had. Uh, we could 
do things spontaneously. We could add sound effects as we were actually doing a scene, uh, and I was kind of in charge of that. They nicknamed me Darth Foley at a certain <laughs> point because I, w- I would add live footsteps to a scene if it enhanced it. Or, uh, you know, of course, I could, uh, after a scene was over, we could always add effects, sure. uh, either pre recorded effects or created effects in the, in the studio and layer it into the skit that we had done, uh, the sketch that we'd done. But for the most part, if it brought a certain verisimilitude and a certain uh, live feeling to the scene, we would try to incorporate uh, uh, sound effects into what we were doing. It's a little bit like there, there's some golden oldie stations that we listen to a lot here in L.A. And every once in a while, like yesterday, I heard a great rock and roll uh, cut of a, you know, a famous song that, that we loved back in, the uh, I guess, the late 50s. And I realized it was probably done live. You know, that's what they yeah, used to yeah. do. They'd bring a, the band in and they'd record them until they got a take that they liked, right? Exactly. It, it, there wasn't a lot of Uber dubbing over Alice in those days because that cost money. Right. You know, the, the longer that you had used the studio, the more it cost you. So they'd like to get them in, lay down the track, and bingo, you got your record. And that was a way that we, that inspired us in a way. Uh, we were called, you know, the jesters of the rock generation. And while we were doing our records, the uh, industry, the, the recording industry, started to to grow uh, by by leaps and bounds, and uh, and it was a very bohemian atmosphere uh, for us at Columbia or in the studios where we were recording, because there were you know that's how we met Chad and Jeremy, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I I eventually shared a house with him, uh, with with Chad, excuse, excuse me, with Jeremy Clyde who we still are friends with and who we saw recently in London. Uh, and and uh, J- Chad and Jeremy were inspired by Fireside Theater to create an album called Cabbages and Kings <laughs> in which Fireside Theater appeared because it was a story album. Okay, yes. And, of course, we were in turn always greatly influenced by the Beatles who were also making story albums you know, with their music. Definitely. Dr. Pepper and all the rest of those wonderful albums. So uh, we were, in a way a part of a movement uh, to create new ways of presenting comedy at the same time that people were presenting new ways of making music did, and did, writing songs. Did Firesign influence Monty Python? Yes, yes, uh, but we were both influenced by the Goon Shows. Mm-hmm. The Goon Shows was the, the mother load for both of us. That was Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan and Harry Seacombe. Amazing. And uh, uh, it was a, a series of very, very surrealistic half-hour BBC shows back in England during the war and the years following it into the 50s uh, that, it, it, that all of the four of us were inspired by, and the, and the Pythons and many, many, many other English comics were inspired by, which is why English comedy is so much more surreal than most of American comedy. Is. I guess the influences that uh, of surrealistic comedy that uh, we used in here in the states uh, as as our heroes were Bob and Ray, yes, and Ernie Kovacs, sure, right, and then Mad Magazine, okay, right, uh, all of which you know we're we're way far out, and we're also dealing with satire, satirizing. Uh, the American way of thinking and speaking and American society. Well, okay? you, you, Firesign had this ability to, to, like I say, go from one thing to another to another with no break between them. It's just one continuous thing. And that's how Monty Python did it, too. That's why I think the influence is so powerful. That's right. And now for something completely different, yes, you know. exactly. <laughs> Click, bingo. Uh, uh, but, but the fact is that the, the through line in both the Python work and in the Firesign work was satirizing the society around them and and uh, surrealistically. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so tonally, they were you. You were akin for sure. 
So, yes, so yeah, we, yeah. we, you and I met many years ago uh, through our mutual good friend Norman Corwin, who was my mentor and teacher, and yes. was perhaps the greatest radio playwright of all time. I know you've know you knew Norman. He's unfortunately gone at this point, but he lived to be 101 years old. God bless him. Mm-hmm. But uh, what did you learn from Norman? Because he was a great radio playwright. Well, what did you learn from him? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, we had the, my wife Melinda Peterson and I had the great pleasure of working with Norman, of being directed by Norman and, and, and acting alongside Norman uh, for many years. So uh, it, we had a unique relationship with him, and, and we were able to, perf- uh, to act in many of his most famous pieces. Isn't that amazing? Which, we re- which were recreated over the years uh, in various formats, before, usually performed before live audience, with sound effects and music included. Uh, but what, what was so amazing about Norman, and we all acknowledged this because we were all radio babies, the four members of the Firestone Theater, was that he ha- had a limitless imagination. Oh, yes. Right? And he knew how to create the mindscapes using just the power of the voice, the, the, the power of storytelling, and the, uh, uh, the amazing uh, effect of sound effects and music on one's imagination. Well, and his use of language was non... Nobody could well, touch I it. Well, I said, you know, storytelling, yeah. his use of words, I mean, was absolutely phenomenal. Phenomenal. And spellbinding. And that was... The bottom line, really, was that he, he was a wonderful writer. Oh, and he could there. translate that into dramatic situations so that characters could bring his writing to life, you know, uh, and, and I think that we were inspired to create what we called Movies for the Mind because of the effect of Norman's uh, in, in, in enormous power uh, on, on all of the radio field at that time. He was indeed the poet of the golden age of radio. Oh, no question. He was extraordinarily influential. And like you say, his, his limitless imagination, here was a guy that was writing, producing, and directing 26 unique uh, anthologized stories, half-hour stories on radio every week. I don't know how he did it. I have honestly. no idea. I, uh, you it's know. amazing. And uh, I, uh, I directed the plot to uh, Overthrow Christmas. Oh, yeah. All right, as a fundraiser. Uh, for uh, our Antaeus Theater Company, Classical yeah. Theater Company, and and uh, Norman came and saw it, and I had designed certain sound effects which I performed live as part of the presentation, and we had uh, the music that I used was our musical director playing on a little toy piano, mm-hmm. okay, to accompany the scene changes and things, and uh, my wife played Eleonora Duzzi, not Eleonora Duzzi, played the. Uh, uh, the Italian uh, um, uh, poisoner. Well, what's her name? Uh, anyway, the <laughs> Italian me. poisoner with with an Italian accent. Right. Now, here's why I mention this. Um, uh, can't remember this this woman's name. It's insane. It's driving me crazy. Anyway, Norman saw the performance, and his comments afterwards. He loved it. I worked beautifully, but his comments afterwards were. Uh, they had worked for hours and hours and hours trying to get a theremin effect of the traveling from uh, hell up to earth and then <laughs> earth down to hell again. Right. Goes, <laughs> I did it with a slide whistle. <laughs> and, and he, he was astounded because it worked perfectly well. <laughs> it was great. You know, and he said, you know, he said, well, we never thought of that. The slide whistle, never thought of that. And, and Eleonora, if I keep saying Eleonora Duzzi, whoever this poisoner was, is famous. You don't know who she is either. I don't, I uh, don't have a clue. And my, my wife is, is working in the garden upstairs, and she'll tell me. L- Lucretia Borgia? Yes, thank you very much, there Lucretia Borgia. Anyway, Melinda did it with an Italian accent. And, and uh, Norman said, well, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and he loved her performance uh, because of that too. You see, anyway, uh, e- even he was open to well. Well, you know this about him. He was open to new ideas, totally. and new approaches to his material right up to the end of his life. Totally, right up to a hundred years old for sure. That's right, because he knew 
he, that was why he was such a great genius. He knew that that things could only get better, you know, as as you approach when you reapproach them. That, that's and he right. had the, the great honor and the great opportunity of reapproaching and reinventing many of his uh, famous radio pieces, uh, you know, with with wonderful contemporary actors, contemporary sound effects. And and music, you know, before a live audience. Yeah. What a joy. Yeah, what a joy. Him. What a joy for us. So, so I, you know, I have a zillion questions for you, and I know that your time is limited today. So I'm going to go to the wrapping this up here, and I'm going to ask you two questions. But I, okay. I, hope, I hope you'll come back on the show in the not-too-distant future because I've got a million questions for you. I would, I would love to. Uh, and uh, I am, you know, promoting my book, uh, Where's My Fortune Cookie? Which is so, phenomenal. Phenomenal yeah, book. Yeah, so I'll be... I'll be doing that for certainly for the next month or so. So let's set up a time and we can talk again. That would be great. And, uh, and, and I'm sure you know that there, there'll be a lot more interesting things we can. And, and I and I must say, in my in my own egomaniacal way, I'm completely floored that you used one of my quotes on the back of the book. But there it is. Oh, so, well, I respect your work very much too, you, Steve. Thank so you. So I was I was honored when you when you uh, sent me a, a reaction to the book. Oh, it was it's, great it's, kind of the you. book is just phenomenal to read. So much fun and in, in you know, short, simple, uh, very colorful, very funny bite. So I really loved it. So, okay, so Good, let, let me let me ask you, you, you've obviously worked and met with tons of people over the years in the entertainment industry. Do you have an oddball or a quirky or a weird or a funny story uh, that you might be able to, to share with the audience? Well, I guess, you know, uh, uh, it has more to do with, like, the Fireside Theater's early early years in the work. Uh, it, it, the book, of course, starts off with Peter and me surviving a gangland shooting mm -hmm. up in San Francisco. And, and that's that's the topic of another time we talk together. But in terms of Firesign Theater experience, when we were just starting to perform here in Los Angeles, we got a, a booking in Sunland, Tahunga, at a movie theater <laughs> that was playing Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Mm -hmm. okay? So it was it said on the marquee, the fire, for, uh, Fahrenheit 451 special live appearance by the fire sign theater <laughs> and then underneath that it said next week the marquis chimps <laughs> okay and, and, and we we uh, had to change for that gig uh, in a barber shop <laughs> down the block okay and then walk to the theater in, in our costumes oh and drapes goodness. up onto the stage and perform in the like the four feet that we had in front of of, of, oh. the, of the actual screen, okay. That, that was that was pretty interesting. That taught us a great deal about uh, you know the the both the limitations uh, and the uh, power of live performance. Well, that, that and, and I think it might have only been better if, in fact, the marquee chimps had been on the platform oh, with you. Oh, that would have been wonderful <laughs> if we'd actually been able to perform with the marquee chimps. But, oh, well, you can't have everything. <laughs> but that's that's marvelous. What, so do you have one good, solid piece of advice or tip that uh, anyone coming up in the business or trying to succeed, what, what may help them? Yeah, I, I think the, from from, you know, reviewing my own story up to now that the main thing that I found worked for me the best was to diversification. You know, uh, I put it this way in, in terms of acting. You should learn how to juggle and ride a horse. Mm. Okay? Uh, diversify. Uh, in, in writing, there's nothing better than experimenting with different styles and trying to tell different stories from different perspectives. Okay? But uh, my favorite story about that uh, is there was an actor and a director who both came out to Hollywood at the same time, and they made a pact. They said, whoever makes it first will help the other person. Mm. Okay? So one day, the actor, who's now at the end of his uh, rope, he's, you know, he's, he's making soup out of cats up. He, he, he's just completely broke, living alone, and the phone rings because they haven't cut it off yet, and it's his friend, the director, and he says, you know, I'm calling from uh, uh, Warner Brothers Studios. I'm at the office at the top of the building here, and uh, I'm calling you because I have some great news. He says, what is it? He says, I'm doing a movie. I've been signed 
to do a movie, and you're going to be in it. I said, thank God. I was about ready to give up. I was going to go back to, to Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> he says, no. He says, look, but I have to ask you a few questions. He says, okay, go. What? He says, can you ride a horse? He says, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can ride a horse. Okay, uh, and uh, can you swim? Yeah, yeah, I can swim. <laughs> wow, that's good. Because uh, the scene is you're riding a horse, and the Indian shoots you in the back with a flaming arrow, and you have to jump <laughs> off the cliff into the water to put out the, 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 the fire. He said, are you still there? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, can, can you do that? He says, sure, look, it's, it's, my, it's a break. It's my first break. You, you, and you, we, you know, our, remember our pact? Yes, I will be there for you. And the director says, great. The reading will be next week at 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, diversify is right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Find something anyway, to do. That's, that story, that's the, the best show business story. It put, you know, puts everything in perspective. Absolutely. But, but in, in fact, that's uh, when I found that whenever a certain area of the business would dry up for me, I could always use another talent and, and pursue another path. You well, know? well, I don't know too many people that are as diverse as you in your total talent and ability. You just do everything. Well, that's, that's kind of you to say, but really it was, it's more a question of discovering what your strengths are. Yeah. You know, yeah. and realizing that the more, uh, the greater the variety of your skill sets, the better chance you will have to have a successful career. To keep in, working. In whatever aspect of the arts that you choose to pursue. Absolutely. Well, F Phil, this has just been, you know, beyond my wildest uh, expectations. I've known and loved your work for my most of my life, and so it's a great privilege for me to have you on the show today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great privilege to be friends with you and uh, to, upon occasion, even break bread with you Occasionally, when you're that's out right. here. That's right. So I hope to see you in person again. And before that, by all means, let's set up another time to chat and we can tell some more stories and share some more Absolutely, because believe me, I've, I've got several pages of interesting questions to ask you that I'd love I to answer. I will be delighted to try to answer them. Please, uh, please say hi to Melinda for me, and, um, and have a great day. Thank you, Steve. You too. Thanks, Phil. Bye for now. Today's Story Beat Tip. Audiences ultimately care only about seeing unique characters in conflict with other unique characters. No doubt, moviegoers want to see gunfights, car chases, explosions, wars, and alien spaceships decimating the landscape. But without characters in conflict with other characters caught up in the middle of a ripping yarn, the audience's attention will fade very quickly, even with all that excitement. Without those characters, they are unlikely to come back for a second look. This applies to all stories, be they large or small, comedy or drama, tragedy or melodrama. Although unforgettable stories are almost always about two or more characters at odds with each other, they can certainly be about a single character attempting to win out against the elements. For proof of this, see a little gem of a movie called All is Lost with Robert Redford. Great stories are usually about desire especially what characters do to overcome conflict so that they can achieve the thing they desire most. All you need to know about conflict is this. A character pursues a goal, but someone or something prevents him or her from reaching it. This must be so for every moment of the entire story. The nature of each character is formed through conflict and the way he or she confronts and deals with the various conflicts he or she encounters. What a character does and how he or she reacts to the world is at least partially how conflict is created, overcome, and recreated. Conflict means that a character's wants and needs are not being met easily. Most conflict in screen stories revolves around an issue of real importance to your principal character or characters that must be confronted and resolved. Conflict creates tension. All worthy screen stories are filled with both conflict and its resulting pressure. Conflict is what drives us to care. It evokes empathy and likability. Why? We have all suffered through our own moments of conflict, and so we relate to the struggle to overcome such challenges. This leads us to root for the protagonist. Conflict creates fully dimensional characters. When we see a character struggling to overcome difficult obstacles, we get to see the true essence of that individual shining through. Character is rarely revealed only through dialogue. Much, if not most, conflict is revealed through action. In fact, action as a means to revealing character is preferred in motion picture storytelling. Remember this adage, show, don't tell. 
Through conflict, resolution is found. In that resolution, we find the meaning of the work and that interesting Greek word, catharsis. Reaching a cathartic resolution almost always winds up being part and parcel of the story's theme. So it can be argued conflict is required to fulfill the story's theme. When people ask, what is the story about? They're usually referring to the story's conflict. So it's on you, the writer, to ensure that some form of conflict is present in every moment of your tale. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.